Hello everyone and welcome. My name is Andrew. And I'm Rachel. And we are Pizza the Scene Podcast. We are a true crime podcast aiming to put you, the listener, at the scene of the crime. Each week we delve into the murky world of lesser known crimes from the UK and Ireland. And occasionally we venture into renowned cases from around the globe. There is a link in our show notes to find all of our social medias, to find our patron, and, well, actually, no, there is no and. That's where you get all our links. If you like, <laughs> if, if you like it that much that you can afford it and you want to support us on Patreon, we have a small family over there. We release our content early every week. We have a bonus episode every week, and we try to do a live episode every quarter, depending on the level that you sign up at. There are merch options, WhatsApp groups, and many more things. So please come and have a look. We offer Patreon not to become rich, simply to help us cover the cost of producing this podcast. Plus, we can be a little bit more open with our thoughts and feelings in a closed community, can't we, Rach? Yeah, and we feel like, absolutely like you said, with our thoughts and feelings, we feel more able to like be open with like comments as well, like when we're talking through cases and i mean andrew and i are actively non-controversial people um but sometimes you know especially when it does come down to the punishment of a crime or you know thoughts on a particular like victim and and the perpetrator as well we definitely feel more like open to discussing this in the in the patreon community don't we we do indeed yes but we are a true crime podcast, just like all the others. Listener discretion is always advised. And today, guess what I'm about to say? There is no exception. <laughs> there never is. And, and like I, yeah, exactly. And like I mentioned a moment ago, we do where possible now release our episodes a week early for our patron supporters. So if you want to hear next week's episode, head over onto a Patreon. So Rachel, how are you doing? How was your cold from last week? It's definitely materialised a lot more. Um, and, it, like, that was really interesting there. You you just went straight in saying, so, Rachel, how are you doing? I was actually going to go, wow, gosh, that's boring, isn't it, Andrew? <laughs> <Do you> remember <laughs> that? remember yes. last week when you were having a go at me? Um, but no, you never make it boring. I don't know why you chose to say that to me. Um, no, no, yeah. it's, it's the same. That's why I switched it up this week. I feel like the cold is really coming out now and, yeah, we're towards the end of it. Happy days. Good. That's good to hear. So, are you ready for some true crime? Oh, yeah. Let's go. I think I said that a bit weird then, but that's okay. If it's safe for you all to do so, I'd like you to relax, close your eyes and picture the scene. Today, I'd like to take us back to December the 4th, 2020. And we visit in Birmingham. Now, Birmingham is the second largest city in the UK. It's located in the West Midlands of England, and it has a population of around 1.2 million people. On this day, we're visiting Summerfield Park, which is located within... Sorry, on this day... I forgot what I was saying then. On this day, we're visiting Summerfield Park, which is located within the Winston Green area of Birmingham. Now, Winston Green is an inner city area of Birmingham that has a population... That includes a large Afro-Caribbean and Asian communities. And it's probably most well known for two things. Firstly, it was the scene of a riot on the 9th of August 2011, which was one of a series of riots in the UK at the time, if you remember those. And secondly, well, more interestingly, I think, because I like the TV show, three years later in 2014, one of the streets within Winston Green was the subject of a television show called Benefit Street. Did you ever watch that? No, I didn't, but um, very, very um, much remember the riots in 2011. Um, very hard to forget. So the Benefit Street is on all four, by the way. And there was an outcry at the time of its release because it showed a cannabis farm on the street and also instructions from one resident on how to avoid detection while out and about shoplifting. So, Oh, wow. Yes, indeed. But back to this day, and Summerfield Park is quite a large park, 24 acres in total, that has a football pitches, basketball, tennis courts, a cricket pitch, just to name a few of its features. But I'm not here to sell it to you. And on this day in 2020, 
as it was a December day, it was winter, it was a Friday, the temperature was around 41 degrees Fahrenheit, which is around 5 degrees Celsius, which is cold enough in itself. But even though it was dry, there was a bitterly cold 18 mile an hour wind blowing, which would, which would have made the weather feel a lot colder than it was. So how Ali would have definitely been feeling the cold. But I'm not sure how much it would have been bothering him as the 29-year-old was there to meet up with a girl he had started messaging with a few Ooh. days. Yeah, exactly. Ooh. A few days before in Instagram, before he moved on to WhatsApp, with the intention to go somewhere for a sexual interaction. I didn't know a how sexual to write. interaction. I didn't know how to write that. So a sexual interaction, yeah. Um the girl he had arranged to meet was Rim Shatari who was 17 at the time and lived locally. The pair had been messaging on WhatsApp right up until around half an hour before they were to meet, which was at some point between 2pm and 2.30pm that afternoon. So somehow, he arrived at the park first and he waited for Vimsha near the entrance to the park. When she arrived, they spoke for a bit. We don't know what about, but somehow was sceptical when Vimsha invited him further into the park to get intimate. So sceptical that he at one point actually turned around and walked out of the park, having been fearful that he was being set up. Vimsha, however, managed to convince him that she wasn't setting him up, that she did want to do sexual stuff with him, and they went inside of the park. So as they walked further inside the park, before Sohail could know what was happening, two men jumped out to confront him. One of the men was holding a gun in one hand, and a large kitchen knife in the other. And these two men were Danish Mansha and Diane Arif. So as they jumped out at him, the one holding the gun and a knife, Danish Mansha, he fired the gun at Sohail several times. But the gun was not there to hurt him though, Rachel, because it was a blank firing pistol, so it could only fire blanks. It was there to scare him. And this was around 2.30pm now. So in the middle of the afternoon. So how didn't know that though, that it was a blank, blanks being fired at him and he was terrified. So he dropped to the ground to avoid the gunshots to protect himself, as probably most people would do, wouldn't they, Rach? Yeah. So you see, Rach, yeah, as I said, the gunshots were designed to scare him, but they were also designed to make him instinctively drop to the floor like he did. But they weren't blanks, were they? Yeah, they were blanks, yeah. Oh, were they? Sorry. It was a Still starter like pistol. It was a... Okay. Um, yeah, they were designed to make him drop to the floor, and he did exactly what they thought he would do. And once he was on the floor, that's when the second part of their plan could come into action. Danish approached him, holding the kitchen knife, and he stabbed him seven times, with the seventh being so forceful that it fractured his breastbone and punctured Sohail's heart. Oh my god! I mean, that must have been done with some like brutality as well. Seven times, like yes, exactly, and exactly, and the last one was so forceful. Not only did yeah. it fra- fracture his breastbone and puncture his heart, when Danish tried to pull the knife out of him, the blade snapped off, <gasps> and it remained in Sohail's body. That's how much it had been stuck in there. Sure. Well, I mean, surely that was fatal then. Well, amazingly, it's funny you should ask that, Rachel. It's like you knew what I was about to say. <laughs> amazingly, despite now being fatally wounded, and these were injuries that Sohail couldn't recover from and put out there now, he did manage to get up to his feet and run out of sheer desperation, trying to right. save trying to save his own life. And as he ran, Danish fired a blank pistol, the blank starter pistol at him a couple more times for reasons we'll never know. So Sohail, he wouldn't make it out of the park. He would collapse in his attempt to escape. But Danish and Diane didn't attempt to chase him. They were satisfied with what they had done. And they fled in the opposite direction. So once outside of the park, the CCTV would capture the pair fist bumping in celebration. So you'd have, well, you'd have to assume it was in celebration of what they had just done together. So later on that evening... Just before midnight, Sohail would die of his injuries in the hospital. Oh, no. I mean, 
I did think when you were going through like the brutality of the attack, like how on earth could he have survived? But that's so sad that he died. So Rachel, yeah, exactly. So Rachel, so what do you think? Why? Well, why do you think they did this? Where was Rimsha in all of this? And how were they all connected? I have no idea on motive. Like, I feel like two 17-year-olds behaving like this, there must be some pretty strong, like, desire. And hopefully, not that you could ever justify it, but hopefully some some sort of, like, yeah, m- like a strong motive as well to have um, brought on, like, such a horrific attack to say so, Like, it's just awful, so... Yeah, I'm. I'm not even gonna guess what they're, what what they were after here. Yeah, you'd have to. Right? I mean, every logical person would probably assume what you've just assumed. So let's see if that's true or not, though. Just because like, that's that's a logical thing doesn't mean that actually happened. And this is the thing, like, isn't it? Isn't it mad? And we go into this like on a number of our pods, don't we? It's mad how people's brains work when it's not like a normal way to behave and i use that i use the word normal like tentatively because obviously we all operate differently we all have our own thoughts and feelings and and behaviors and things like that but even if this even if sahel has done the unthinkable and and caused harm or damage to someone or something you know he still does not deserve to be attacked in that way and, and fear for his life and then lose his life. Like, you know, you cannot take the law into your own hands, can you? So, no, And I, I know I'm going on a bit of a rant now and you've not even told us why he was targeted. But I guess I just wanted to get across my point that regardless of what you say now, it's not going to be justified to me. No, that's, that's reasonable for you to say that. Well, you see, Rachel, they were all friends. And what I mean by... They were all friends. I mean, Danish, Dayan, and Rimsha, the, the, not the victim, so how, but the three perpetrators were all friends. And to explain this, now please do remember, this backs up really what Rachel said, but please do remember everyone that said explain, not justify. To explain this, we need to go back a few days. So a few days earlier, what seems to be the norm these days is that while scrolling through Instagram, so how came across Rimsha's profile. And he liked what he saw. So he dropped her DM. I believe the, the term is he slid into her DMs. I've never actually done that. Um, slid in, I've slid into many places when I've fallen over, but not a DM. Yes. But, so, but she responded positively, and they started talking. So quite quickly, though, in a conversation, Soho steered it towards suggestive and sexual topics. And while initially Rimsha didn't, object and she participated so how started to be a lot more sexual and a lot more sexually aggressive in oh. his t- in his tone and topics so this put Rimsha off and she was just going to block him stop talking to him after all I guess that's one of the good things about internet communication with someone you've never met in person before you can easily just cut off communication with them can't you yeah that's the benefit you block restrict whatever you need to do and, and move on with your life, don't you? You do indeed. Before she did, though, she did what I guess most people, teenagers or not, do when something interesting or disgusting or shocking happens to them. She spoke about it with two of her closest friends, Danish and Dayan, who were the two eventual attackers of Soha, I remember. Rather than agree that she should cut off, cut off contact with Soha, they told her that she should carry on talking to him to encourage him, arrange to meet him because what he was doing was not right, so he needed to be taught a lesson. Oh, wow. So it literally went from 0 to 100. Yes, she was She was going to just block, block him, but they were like, no, don't do that. Let's meet him and teach him a lesson. It's mad because like, teaching him a lesson would have been like catfishing him or something, making him believe that he was going to... Yeah. Again, I'm not condoning, like, catfishing, but 
you know, making him believe that he was going to go meet somebody and getting caught with his pants down almost, like not literally, but figuratively speaking, like, and then saying, you know, it's inappropriate to behave that way with a girl this age and, and, and over social media as well. So back off, leave her alone and learn your lesson. Yeah. Not not what they did to him. Like, that's just brutality. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't know what was to say then, yeah, because I agree completely with you, Rachel. Over the next few days, with the help of her two friends, Grimshaw did just that. She moved the conversation from Instagram to WhatsApp to make it easier. And she started to positively interact with Soha again. So make she made him think the things he was into and the things he wanted to do with her, sexually that is, she was open and willing to try it out. So in that time, Danish and Diane, they would start planning their attack from all of the evidence that was obtained. And I'll go into a little bit later about that. It seems their plan was not to kill him, but it was to seriously injure him, to stab him and teach him a lesson. So on the day in question, like I said earlier, Grimshaw was WhatsApping with Sohio to ensure he'd turn up. And she was messaging with him right up until 30 minutes before the attack. And Danish and Dayan, they got themselves ready. They dressed all in black. They wore gloves. They had a face mask, mask on each, which covered most of their face, which was to hide their face. But we have to remember this was a time of COVID. So it wouldn't have even looked amiss in the street that they were wearing these masks. And they also. Very, put... very fortunate then. Yes. Very lucky. Yeah, exactly. And they also pulled their hoods up over their heads to help hide their identity. So they knew they had to hide their identity. Danish got the starter pistol. I'm not sure where he was from. It was never mentioned, but he got it. And he also got a large kitchen knife. They then went to the park in advance and they hid themselves, ready to pounce on Sohio when he was close enough. So I guess, Rachel, this explains why when Sohio and Bimsha first met near the entrance of the park, he was sceptical and left before Bimsha convinced him it wasn't a setup and he turned around and went into the park with her. I mean, I've not done this, but I'm guessing it probably felt a bit too easy and unreal for him because, after all, like, we're all adults here listening to this. Like, sexual talk around a fantasy between two consenting people. And I say we're adults talking about this, but I, I also say consenting pe- people because I'm not sure a 17-year-old is always an adult, and in Rimsha's case particularly so. Uh, and I'll get onto that later. But that type of talk, it really actually turns into reality, does it? It's It's more just to get each person off, so to speak. I guess so. Again, like, I can only tentatively answer because I'm not really, I don't know, naivety naivety in me or whatever, but I've never really experienced, like, a relationship or, like, where it's primarily like that. Does that make sense? Like It makes sense. We know, we know secretly you do it all the time, but, yeah, it, <laughs> make, it makes sense, yeah. But we're just we're out. The, we're, the, just we're the pre-Facebook, pre-social media generation, though, aren't we? We are, Like, it yes. came in when we were that bit more grown up. And then, God, like, WhatsApp came in even later on. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I don't want to, like... I, I basically sounded like an old granny now, aren't I? No, but you're right, though. It's the assumption, like, usually, even when you're in a loving relationship... I'm not going to get into details here. But, <laughs> but even when you're in a loving relationship, fantasy is fantasy, isn't it? It, it I mean, it, it can turn into something different, but a lot of the times... It saved its purpose for one thing, doesn't it? Anyway, yeah. yeah, anyway, that's enough on that. Um, we're not that type of podcast, but so I've already described the attack. And so how he was found by some members of the public and he was rushed to the hospital. And like he already mentioned, despite the best efforts of the doctors and nurses in the hospital, he succumbed to his injuries just before midnight on the same day. So now let's move on to how the police caught them. And a subsequent trial, shall we, Rachel? Yeah. Well, obviously, Birmingham is the second city of the UK to most people. So it's going to have what most of our large cities have. And that's lots of CCTV. So when the police started investigating this, they realised that while they had no idea who the attackers were, 
they were able, with enough investigation, to initially catch Rimshe meeting with Sohail at the entrance of the park, and then following him as he left the park to convince him to go back inside, and then them entering the park together before she left by herself. Yeah, and these are a bunch of 17-year-olds, aren't they? They're not going to be savvy in the res- in the in respect to like their whereabouts and making sure that they like cover their tracks, are they? Yeah, exactly. And she had made no attempt to hide her identity. I know the others had masks on and hoods up, but she was meeting him allegedly to do stuff with him. So she's not going to be covering her face up, is she? Um no. so she so she had made no attempt to hide her identity. And they were able to virtually trace her back to her home. And they also had Sohail's phone. So while not immediately, eventually once they investigated it, they also had that to confirm that it was her. So for Danish and Diane, it was a little bit more difficult. The attack wasn't captured on any CCTV. And while the police did capture them leaving the park and fist bumping, like I said, shortly outside of the park to celebrate what they had just done, and that video can be found online, by the way. Uh, they just couldn't be identified that way. Once they knew what they looked like, though, I think with their hoods up and whatnot, they could be followed. Both their movements after they left the park, but also going in reverse, and their movements going backwards when they went to the park. Now, it took a good few days, but the police were able, thanks to CCTV, to identify all three defendants. And then a few days later, when they were sure who they were, they were arrested. Now, once arrested, the interviews of all three led to nothing at all for the police. All three of them would no comment away from the interviews. But, Rach, and I love doing this because I know how much happiness it gives you, your favourite item was collected from all three of them. And I think you know what I'm talking about, don't you? Telephone evidence. Yes, indeed. That's right. They're mo- I've actually even wrote. Yes, that's right, their mobile phones, because I knew you'd get that right, (laughs) Rachel. Um, So while they had been smart enough to delete quite a lot of evidence from their phones, with what they had left on and a dedicated digital forensics team, the police were able to recover all the deleted content, and so the police ended up with a lot of damning evidence. Yeah, and, and let's be clear, like, nothing is safe anymore. Nothing is sacred. When it comes to like phones, you know, even WhatsApps, oh, these messages are encrypted. Like, no. And, you know, they talk about not being able to like record you in meetings or in certain environments. They'll still record you. They'll find a way through, won't they? Like, yes. nothing is sacred anymore in, in this day and age. Although I was reading, go off on a little bit of a tangent. I was reading the other day one of the reasons why, um, that the UK has now brought in, that it, is, it can be a crime and you can be sent to prison for not providing your your passwords for your phone, is that the, yeah. iPhone, the iPhone, apparently, if properly locked, the police can't get into. Oh, uh, right, okay, so Apple, yeah. app, the security that Apple have put on them. Yeah, apparently Android's, like, they can get into them, but Apple's, they can't. So, yes, like I said, they delete the stuff, but the police got all everything that deleted. And the police now just do go... you... Sorry. Sorry, on that tangent, I just wanted to ask, do you believe it's fair that they can uh, charge you with obstructing the course of justice by not giving your passcode? Well, I remember reading a while ago about this person who... It was eventually proved that they killed someone. I can't remember the full details, but this guy spent, I think, a couple of years in prison because he refused to give his details of his phone. Um, yep. And they got all the evidence in the end, I think, and he never actually gave it up. But it depends. I think there has to be other... I mean, they can't just arrest you, find absolutely nothing, and then say, right, we're keeping you in prison. It still has to go to court, and the, the judge has to... Um, the judge has to decide agree. that... Yeah, agree, but they can't just say... We found absolutely nothing, but we think there might be some phones, so we're keeping him in there. There has to be like other, maybe circumstantial or, or that. But I think it's right if they, if it's largely if it's a final piece of in a puzzle, and they've got enough that maybe they could take it to court, but maybe not sure they could get a conviction. Yeah. Then yeah, what if someone's not hiding anything? Why not give it up? 
yeah, I was just curious about how you, you know, what your thoughts and yeah. opinions were on it. I mean, if it was me personally, I mean, I've never owned an Apple and hopefully I'll never be arrested. So it won't happen to me. But if it was me and I had nothing, to, if I had something to hide, then yeah, grand, I would never let them in. But if I had nothing to hide, I'd probably say like, okay, but I want it under supervision of my legal team or something like that. You know what I mean? So at least if I didn't trust them not to plant something, at least then it could be like, well, yeah, and I guess you've got to have faith that they're not, they're not going to plant something. But yeah. as well, the difficulty is the interpretation of messages, right? Not the footsteps, not the digital footprint or the behaviours. And I'm not talking about a message that says, I'm going to fucking do him in or something like yeah. that. That's blatant, right? But I'm talking about a message that says, like, you know, when you... When you open up your feelings to someone else and say, I'm really pissed off, like, I'm so angry, I could kill her right now. Like, that, yeah, if somebody has died and your messages in that private moment to your friends or family were off-the-cuff comments that were made, that, let's be honest, we all make at times, I could fucking strangle you right now. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. No, I get you, yeah. They can be so badly misinterpreted, can't they? Yeah, you're right, they can be. Um... And that's what concerns me, is when they start building cases on their beliefs and and, and messages that help play into the narrative. Uh, We've gone completely off on a tangent, because like what you said here, their mobile phones were able to place them in areas, right? And absolutely was categorically right for this case to help discuss their collusion and to find them all three of them were equally as responsible for what happened that night in question but in general in other cases i feel it's it can be incredibly tricky situation it can with be. mobile phone messages and data it can be you know what i just don't understand like if you've got using your phone or whatever why not just chuck it in a river chuck it in a lake i don't know why people hold on to them like doesn't matter then if the police find it, it's destroyed. But um, anyway, you're right, though. Um, well, it wasn't really the location data that the police found. What they found was all the conversations with Rimsha and Sohail. But they also had Sohail's phone to confirm this. But obviously having both sides is good. But they also found messages between all three of them. And a lot of messages with the two directing Rimsha what to say to Sohail in her conversations and also between the three planning the attack and what they plan to do to him, so how down to scaring him with the blank starter pistol and then teaching him a lesson by stabbing him. They had planned to just seriously injure him, though, not to kill him. That's why I knew all that stuff. I wasn't making it up. They actually got all this information from text messages between them. Um, yeah. So that's pretty damning, isn't it, really? Uh, what if... kind of lesson is he going to be taught by being stabbed? For I know. fuck's sake. Like... I know. That's their naivety, though, isn't it? Yeah. We said it last week, didn't we? If you, if you, if you want to fight with somebody, use your fists. Be brave. Like, don't hide behind a weapon. Yeah. It's like a a, a fool's way out, isn't it? Yeah. All three of them would be charged under joint enterprise with the murder of Ohio. All three would be not guilty to the murder. And at no point did any of them ever give any explanation to the police or in court. Other than to say no common, and they did not give evidence themselves. Oh, wow. So they didn't even try and blame one another? No. Wow. So the trial itself would last 10 weeks, and it was mainly focused on digital evidence that I spoke about, including the CCTV. I don't think it'd be a massive shock to you, Rachel, or to our listeners, to discover that all three would be found guilty. Not all of murder, though. Oh. Danish. The one who did the actual attacking was found guilty of murder and guilty of possession of a bladed article, and he he would be sentenced to life with a minimum term of 19 years. Dayan, who was with him, would be, would be found guilty of manslaughter, and he would be given a term of three years and six months. Bimsha would be found guilty of murder, and she would be given life, with a minimum term of nine years for her part in the crime. Wow, that's a relatively 
like lax sentence really isn't it yeah well the fact yeah that she lured him in yeah definitely but you're right and, you know, and yeah. essentially she started the ball rolling with the boys as well didn't she yeah yeah you're right yeah so the judge would comment when sentencing that he believed the text beforehand and the fist bump afterwards showed that Diane was just as much involved as Danish. Though I'm guessing, and this is just an assumption here, he would have probably, the judge would have probably wanted murder for him too, but obviously it was a jury that found him not guilty of murder and guilty of manslaughter, given those comments that the judge said. The judge actually said, you're just as guilty, but yeah. obviously... Um, His hands are tied there, right? Yeah. The judge did say that he didn't believe this was a premeditated murder and that he thinks it just got out of hand when Danish was full of, and as you said this, the judge actually said, Danish was just full of naivety and bravado and he got carried away when the attack started. Now he cited evidence for this as the fact that he fired a starter pistol at Sohail as he ran away, knowing full well the state he was in, and that it had no impact on him whatsoever. He also stated, and this will touch on why Rimshaw got a lower sentence, he also stated that he acknowledged that Rimshaw was a vulnerable individual with a background to show this, and that she also had a low IQ and other issues, and that she had been influenced and encouraged to do this by Danish and Diane. So that's why she was on the lower end of the murder sentence. I, I'm, yeah. I'm no, sure. I know you don't agree, but that's the, that was the judge's reasoning behind it. Yeah, yeah. So I don't give quotes too much these days from after the trial, but I wanted to on this occasion. So firstly, just two quotes, two short ones. Firstly, one from Laura Harrison, who was a pl- on the police's homicide team, and she was a detective who investigated the murder. She said this, This case is really sad. It was a completely senseless attack that took her life and changed three more forever. Now, I wanted to include that because I think personally, Rachel, that that probably sums it up perfectly, doesn't it? It was senseless, it changed, it took one and changed three more lives and it didn't need to happen. A simple block would have been enough. Yeah, like I say, like, you know, 17, you kind of feel probably that you want some sort of revenge or payback or whatever there are other ways and means to go about it than coming for some premeditated planned attack with a start pistol and a knife like yeah absolutely well out of control and wholly unnecessary and yet like it or not the four lives have been totally damaged in this process one completely lost but three derailed yeah and I, I just want to finish with just a small part of the statement from Soul House family which supports one from the, the detective it says this we are pleased that the defendants were found guilty and sentenced today for the brutal crime they committed sadly nothing could bring Soul House back to us Soul House was murdered needlessly and his life has been stolen from him. The pain that we suffer for it from his loss is overwhelming. He will forever remain in our hearts. Now, as I was reading that, Rachel, I realised that myself, so I guess other people as well, sometimes we could become a little bit too desensitised to all this, can't we? We can hear or see that type of quote, and we can think, well, yeah, that's pretty standard. That's what we hear all the time. But then I realised you've got to remember to Soho family, that's heartfelt, that's genuine, and that's 100% unique to them. Just because we see it all the time, sometimes we can think, like, I think I've been guilty in the past, I think I'm not going to mention that because they all say that. But to them, like, their lives have changed forever. They've lost him from their lives. Yeah, and these, these victim impact statements, victims are feeling the same, because, like, especially in the kind of cases that we cover because a lot of them are around, like, you know, someone who's lost their life unfairly. And um, it is difficult, but I also think it's important, even if we are repeating ourselves week in, week out, that we hear from the victims' families because and the people that are left after the the attacks and the crimes and the 
you know, the, the, the cases because it just reminds us that there was an innocent person or there was an unfortunate person, you know, impacted by this crime. And, you know, we, we wrap up our episodes kind of ending on on those notes. And, yeah. and not not on the not on the the folk not focusing our attention on the perpetrators who, let's be honest, get far too much airtime in the press, don't they? Yeah. Yeah, you're right, Rachel. You're right. I I should I should think about this more in the future. I know I do want to end this with something not about the victim or the perpetrators, though, really. Because before we wrap it, wrap up, I just want to bring up something else I found when I was researching this case. And something that saddened me quite a lot. So there was an article published on medium.com. Have you heard of that website? You probably read a few articles in your time on it. No, I don't think so, but go ahead. I think you probably have, but you don't notice the names. You know, when you're clicking on uh, it's an article, it's quite big and famous. And I will name it because I want to name it. Now, I'm not a fan of that site. I've got, well, I've got no real feelings toward it, but I did think it was respectable, just one of the sites that churn out. It's from the States and churn out content all the time. But there was an article published in it which stated that Soul Heil was an incel. It's not true, I don't think, by the way, just to put it out there. And that the three of them only took action because the UK government didn't. Again, not true, because... I'm not sure a crime was committed, but even if it was, they didn't report anything. And it calls them heroes. It uses words like slut shaming, which I assume aimed at Vimsha being a slut. Although, to be quite perfectly honest with you, I couldn't figure it out from the article. Some of it didn't make sense. Um, And it is better to do stuff like this, like kill someone, to ensure that women have rights. And it also stated that society needed purging, that the UK government should pardon them. And a petition was started to do this, but thankfully it only got 103 signatures. I just found that quite shocking and quite sad in that a mainstream news website, which charges people, if you want to, for a premium service, would allow an article like this on there. I was going to say, are you sure this is a mainstream website yes yes like let me have it i'm I'm gonna use the magic of editing people to cut out the bit in between but just let me google medium.com and tell you how big it is if you don't mind rachel so it says here it's been going since 2012 um has some behind a paywall some not behind a paywall um its membership is five dollars a month. It's in 2015. It doesn't publish official user stats on its website, but in 2015, the total number of users was 25 million. In 2016, it had about 60 million monthly visitors. Wow. And and even like in 2020, it launched a separate thing with subjects of anti-racism and civil rights. It's it's it accepts what I think it is. It accepts reader submitted articles, and obviously it does no checks on these because it was one of those. Yeah. But yeah, it's just uh, like, and it it can't be that bad. Be- well, I mean, it can't be seen as that bad because all the nasty governments in the world, like Russia and China and whatnot, they banned access to it, censored it. So, um, yeah. But anyway, yeah. No, so of what from what you've told me, so medium dot com is that? Yeah, so it's just weird how they'd allow something on there, and it's quite blatantly made up. Like, like who in yeah. the right, who in the right mind? That's like, okay. He was being sexually in a conversation with a seventeen-year-old. Okay, um, which technically isn't illegal in the UK, but um, and it's inappropriate been, as a twenty-nine-year-old, yeah, massively, it's in, massively inappropriate, and he's been sexually aggressive, but um. Nowhere ever is the way to give, and like it should be a given that women should have the same rights as men. Okay, I know it's not everywhere in the world, it should be a given, but nowhere ever is the way to get that by killing people, is it? 
no, absolutely. And I think I've already made my point clear on that point. Um, but I just, I don't understand. First of all, um, I'm just going to potentially sound like a right granny here. What's an incel? An incel is an, it's short for involuntary celibate. So it's it's become a movement recently and there's been lots of people like the guy in Plymouth who killed people. Do you remember who shot people? And there's been ones in America as well where basically it's men who can't find a relationship and can't have sex or involuntary celebrate incel and right. they and they learn to hate women because they um they think women only go for a certain type and it, it's a certain type of like basically a horrible person who has a hatred so, towards women and society so essentially this article is trying to put the hate and the shame on Sahel and away from the teenagers who inflicted the the actual pain um, and suffering on him yeah, yeah it basically said they were heroes oh my god and they should be pardoned and let out and they've been they did what they did to protect the rights of women and yeah it's just but absolutely um, clutching at straws there yeah, but anyway, I just found it really shocking and saddening. Obviously, these parts of the internet exist, but you wouldn't expect it on a mainstream um, website. So, yeah, I'm going to wrap this one up. But before I do, I think you said almost everything. But is what do you think of this one? Is there anything else that you want to add? Again, like, it's just so unfortunate. You've, you've already said it, haven't you? Such an unfortunate, like, unnecessary case to be bringing to us. Yeah, I think you've you said that you want i'm gonna wrap this up then this has been season four episode 10 called dm to murder and if it's safe you to do so i like to relax close your eyes and picture the scene sadly it's pretty standard these days for people mostly women to receive unwanted and unwelcome contact online from people wanting something sexual but is it really acceptable to retaliate with violence or Are we wrong? And do these people really need to be taught a lesson? Okay, so thank you, everyone. And until next week, hopefully Rachel won't have things up up, up her nose while we record a podcast. And uh, dare you dob me in like that. (laughs) And uh, you stay safe, everyone, and we shall speak to you soon. Stay safe. Thanks, guys. Bye. (laughs) 